You're listening to 99.1 WQRTLP Indianapolis. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Radio Free Book Club. I'm Ken Honeywell. I'm a writer and reader from Indianapolis. And this is our second show for August 2022. Today, we'll be discussing one of the year's most hotly anticipated and most reviewed novels, Jennifer Egan's The Candy House. Egan calls The Candy House a sibling novel to her 2010 novel, A Visit from the Goon Squad, which won won both the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction and a National Book Critics Circle Award. Regular readers liked it, and really fancy readers liked it. Um, I'm sure we're going to have a great discussion. I'm joined in the studio today by three other club members, whom I'm going to ask to introduce themselves. Christine, you want to start? Sure. Um, Hi, everyone. My name is Christine Hudson. I'm an Indianapolis native. Grew up right around like the Broadway area. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting Ken at Well Done Marketing. Um, spent my career in marketing and tech, and have spent a lifetime reading. So I'm super excited to be here. Yeah, thanks, Christine. Tracy, I'm Tracy Kumbe. I'm a marketing writer, bread baker, and hiker living in Indianapolis. Thank you, Tracy. Maurice brought us. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> that's you. <laughs> I know. Literally, we have like, oh, yeah, that's me. Uh, my name is Maurice Broadus. I uh, I basically have three jobs. I am a teacher, a middle school teacher over the Oaks Academy Middle School. I am the resident Afrofuturist at the Kepler Institute, and I am a science fiction and fantasy author. And what did you tell us you were working on as you came in? I am currently working on a historical middle grade novel, which is my way of procrastinating from writing the sequel to my science fiction novel I'm supposed to be doing. Awesome. (laughs) All right. Good to know. Well, thanks, everybody. And just a reminder, as we get going, this is a book club. It's not a book review. There will be spoilers. We're not interviewing Jennifer Egan, unlike apparently every other book show or podcast in the country, uh, which is not to disparage anybody. She's a really good interview, and she's really generous with her uh, discussion of not just her books, but her writing process. She's a great interview, and there's a lot of great interviews out there. But we are going to talk about the book. So uh, let's get started. Would anyone like to start by telling us what they think this book was about? Sure. <laughs> I feel like um, in, I feel like this book was about identity and authenticity. And I think in uh, one of the characters, I think it was Jazz, was asking for answers in five words or less. So I think in five words or less, this book is about understanding your identity and authenticity. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what I thought it was about, in short. And it happens in... in- Across, what, 15 different perspectives, every chapter is coming from a different character. So we're getting a different starting point, an entirely different voice, sometimes a a very different way of storytelling. But it's across this group of people who are loosely connected and, of course, loosely connected to um, or repeating from the characters in A Visit from the Goon Squad. Yeah, I was just uh, thinking about the whole idea of authenticity and like, all right, so there's you have these in, uh, interconnected portraits of folks uh, in the quest for uh, authenticity, but then there's also, I don't know, there, there was just something profoundly lonely about all of the characters, and so it's like out of that loneliness, there was this sort of a. Uh, Search for something. Everybody would seem to be searching for something. I mean, authenticity might be at the root of it, but they all seem to be searching for something. Yeah, I think that's I think that's really interesting, Maurice. And I and I think one of the things that I noticed in the book was this idea that we are um, in a lot of cases, we're kind of minor characters in each other's lives. There are minor characters. In fact, a lot of the minor characters in A Visit from the Goon Squad become the major characters in The Candy House. Um, but even throughout this book, there are just appearances of characters in everybody else's story. Um, toward the end of it, um, there, was a, there was one of the chapters where Hannah was the narrator Mm -hmm. and Hannah showed up later just in a line as uh, Bix's attorney, you know, some years after that, that story happened. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just, and that just kind of got me thinking overall about, you know, what we are to each other. We're all the protagonists in our own lives, but you know, we're characters of various importance, you know, to each other. Yeah. 
I also got a sense that the book is very much about like shifting perceptions of our own reality and shifting perceptions of our own identity. And especially in like how we see our identity, our identity through other people's eyes, which I think leads back to the point where we feel like the protagonist in our own life. And we maybe think we're the protagonists in other people's lives, but we are just supporting characters. And I feel like that perception takes a while to mold and shift, um, which I think a lot of the characters, Maurice, I thought they felt lonely and sad and searching, too, like just confused. Um, and we got to intersect with characters at different ages, especially Sasha, who is in a Visit for the Goon Squad, like quite heavily, and then also still in the Candy House. So I think I thought it was interesting to, like, see those perceptions throughout different characters' lives and times of their lives and actually just ages. Yeah, I think it was interesting um, to kind of both of those last two points, the scene where Drew is wondering whether he should get in the balloon basket or not. And he's agonizing over it. And he's, you know, he thinks he has a responsibility to Miles, right? And he's worried about the balloon captain and he hops into the basket and clearly Miles doesn't care a bit and the balloon captain is thinking about something <laughs> yeah. else and he, you know. <laughs> and Miles was like disappointed that he was there. He was right. like, I got to stay with Miles. And Miles was like, oh God, he's coming along. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you guys think? Uh, what, I mean, this was a, in a, in a way, this was just a lot of kind of connected stories. Which of these chapters worked for you? Which ones did you enjoy? Which ones do you think, you know, uh, just kind of resonated with you? Which ones maybe less so? I'll tell you what, the one that I loved with a white hot burning passion was the one about Lincoln, the counter, the one who is, is quantifying everything right. and he has. And by the way, this is the first thing I highlighted in the book. He has this great line about um, where the alluders have it wrong is that quantifiability doesn't make human life any less remarkable or even, and this is counterintuitive, I know, less mysterious, any more than identifying the rhyme scheme in a poem devalues the poem itself. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. But I think that one of the things that was great about that chapter was just how completely immersed the author was in that voice and in that way of looking at the world, which is definitely not a way that I look at the world or that I have really seen represented a lot. So that for one, that for me is the one that completely stands out. Yeah, I think that was my number two choice what was that one. But my number three choice was the whole story about the guy who was the shrieker. Uh, for some reason, that really just amused me uh, to no end because I'm like, cause, partly because of that self-reflection of like, Ooh, do I do this in life? Just going around just sort of provoking folks in order to... It's not even for a test for authenticity. It's more of like, ah, I'm stuck in my book and I need to provoke a reaction out of somebody. Let me just poke somebody, see what the authentic reaction will be so I can write it down later. Um, so the streaker would be my third uh, one. But the first one, the, the one that really uh, stuck out to me was the um, um, is, uh, uh, the lady as a citizen agent. Mm. Right. And uh, and so that story, especially the way it was told as like a series of lists. Right. Lulu the spy. Right. Um, That that one. And it's probably because it was more. It felt really on the that it was probably angling more towards that science fiction edge of of this book. Um, So that's probably why it resonated more with me. But uh, and, and the way that story was told as a series of instructions. Um, I thought that was just really clever, and, and that's what really stuck out to me. Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it it certainly sticks out, and I think we should talk more about that, about how, how it works, how well it works, how it works for those of you who remember it in comparison to the famous PowerPoint story mm-hmm. in A Visit from the Goon Squad. Um, but, I, but at the heart of it, it was a pretty conventional little spy thriller, <laughs> you was. know, in comparison <laughs> to almost anything else in the book. Right, yeah. right. but... Th- and I think the, like I said, it was the part, the part of, uh, and I'm reading it as a science fiction writer, going, oh, I wonder how I could do something similar but different, uh, in that. So, which is my problem reading a lot of these books in the first place is like half the time I, I don't read nearly as fast as I used to because I'm teasing it apart to go, how does this work? How do I do this? Or how, how does the author do this? And how can I do that? Uh, do something to sort of replicate that effect, if mm-hmm. not the actual story on the page, right? Because, right? uh, you know, like you said, it's pretty conventional, but it's like, but there's something in there. I'm just like, there is something in here. I got to figure it out. It's not nagging at the back of my brain. Right. There's something here. I got to, I got to figure out. 
You know, the, um, that, the story about Alfred the Screamer, um, that was also, you know, interestingly, that was written by Rebecca, who yeah. was in the first story, who was the one who kind of followed Bix around. That was part of her dissertation. And that, if you remember from Goon Squad, mm-hmm. Rebecca was the wife of Alex. Of Alex. Yeah. Who like helped front like Scotty's reunion show was a big deal when right. really he was just like contacting influencers and everyone was like, This is gonna be great, but no one actually thought that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They were just repeating what they'd heard. Yeah. Yeah. Um I guess to answer your original question, Ken, Tracy, I had the same reaction. The first thing I wrote that I liked was Lincoln's chapter. I loved Lincoln's chapter. And I thought the storyline there was so good, like Lincoln finally finding a connection with his dad and with his family. I loved the whole thing. Um, I loved that chapter. But I would I think my absolute favorite chapter was actually that crazy email chapter. Um, I thought it was like such a fascinating and brilliant way to tie together Almost every storyline across the Candy House and also across the visit from the Goon Squad all tied together in a series of like chaotic emails where people were mostly pretending to be something that they weren't. And all of this was because of Lulu's search to find her dad eventually. And it was just like this spiraling chain of emails that started with like what Lulu just wanted to talk to Jazz. (laughs) And then it ended up with, like, a documentary and a Conduit's reunion show and, like, uh, Lulu, like, almost got a job. (laughs) Like, it was just, I don't know. I loved it. I thought it was the funniest chapter in the book. And Right. Everybody had a different agenda. Yeah. (laughs) For sure. And then somehow it all came together. (laughs) Right? It just, like, all worked. Um, I loved it. I don't know. I was not expecting to like that chapter so much because at the time I was like, oh, it's going to be gimmicky or like, who knows? I thought it was great. I thought it was such a good way to tie in all those storylines. The gimmicky thing is kind of interesting because like I never read the Goon Squad novel. So I'm, I'm coming at this from second novel type thing. And so I was wondering about your reaction, like the, all the stuff from the list to the emails. And I, so I gather that a lot of that kind of stuff happened in the, in the Goon Squad novel. Well, um, there, were, there was a um, there was a pretty famous chapter of a visit from the Goon Squad that was written in PowerPoint. Entirely right? in PowerPoint. Gotcha. I can show right. you what it looks like. Really. And it's incredibly moving. It was. Right. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's, okay. It's it just is. It's like 40 pages of this. Well, okay. So now I, now I have two questions now. <laughs> okay. So one is how much of the, uh, so like when it comes to when you sit, come down to read Candy House, how much of that felt gimmicky at this point? Now that you've seen, you know, like, oh, she's pulling out new tricks. But now, you know, we're kind of used to her doing tricks. Um, so that, that's my first question. I, my answer to that is, yeah, it, it, you know, it was sort of like, oh, yeah, here comes the gimmick. No, I think they were really well executed. I mean, I, I, I kind of bought into them. I mean, they were really interesting to read. The email chain, I think, especially for me, was just felt like it rang true. You had, I mean, it was just a branching <laughs> series of conversations. <laughs> With different people getting dragged in and right. like, mm-hmm. subverted and BCC. And then back channel <laughs> communications <laughs> on top right. of it. <laughs> um, but... I to me I don't know what you guys thought I yeah I it was like okay, okay here's here's her gimmick chapters yeah well I I was think I was prepared for it to be a gimmick but I think if anything the the message chapter felt less gimmicky than the PowerPoint chapter I didn't dislike the PowerPoint chapter but I kept waiting to understand why Allison was so obsessed with PowerPoints because that whole chapter was really from her point of view so I was hoping. Um, she was one of my favorite characters in A Visit from the Goon Squad. I thought she was a great pair with Lincoln. Um, she was, what, an impressionist to his counter, and I thought they were a fantastic pair. But I don't think Allison ever really got fully explained. Like, I was hoping to figure out why she thinks about the world in PowerPoint presentations or in slide decks. So it never happened. So I'm left feeling like the PowerPoints were kind of gimmicky more so than the message the text ma- or the um, email chapter mm-hmm. or even Lulu's chapter, which was also weird. I'm probably easy. I don't know. Those those chapters don't give me any heartburn or make me feel used or cheap. They're they're <laughs> they're cheap. She pulls off what she's getting across. She pulls off the storytelling so well that I am 100 percent willing to go on that ride with her. I also think it's it's interesting because she's telling the, the the stories of 
what, 40 characters. I started to make a list of all the characters because mm. I was getting so overwhelmed. I need and a chart. Was, <laughs> I have it in my bag. I can show it to you. But it's like, <laughs> it. I think A Visit from the Goon Squad, I counted like 80 characters that were mentioned. Not all of them got explained. And then the Candy House was like another 80 some odd characters. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how else do you tell the stories of, you know, maybe 15 or 20 of those characters without having varying like stylistic like um, approaches so I liked it I just I I, I wish I understood Allison's PowerPoint yeah I mean <laughs> I I think from a storytelling standpoint I think that the thing about that was so interesting was that it really boiled down the elements of a story into almost nothing right mm -hmm. into such few words um, yeah, and a, an yeah. attempt to like show the relationships between the people among the, mm -hmm. these members of this family. And I think, you know, the, I think the Lula the Spy story was similar in that way and that it, it broke, it, it told a story in very few words that, that were, as you said, Maurice, like a list, like a list of instructions to myself, mm -hmm. um, which is a lot different from the email chapter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But I mean, I think that was also a pretty, uh, a pretty interesting accomplishment. Okay, Maurice. Oh, I'm sorry, Christine. Well, Go I was, ahead. I was going to say that PowerPoint chapter also, now that you said that, Ken, that PowerPoint chapter not only told a compelling story about Allison, but it told a story about Lincoln, Andrew, and Sasha, right. the whole family, and really just slides and graphics pretty fascinating and i think for sasha that was a really important chapter for her character development to go from like crazy in the goon squad she was like a thief living in naples to go from that to like a successful artist and mother and i feel like that was very clear in the powerpoint well so, so that actually ties right into my, my second question which is so i see all the hardcovers in front of you all <laughs> and you notice there's a lack of hardcover in front of me so i did the audiobook Ooh. Hmm. Uh, which is a, a, a completely different uh, reading experience. And so I'm, I'm wondering how well, like the, the list chapter worked well, the email chapter worked well as an audiobook experience. But I'm as I'm hearing this discussion, I'm like, man, how would PowerPoints translate into an audio? Oh, gosh, what a great story. question. Yeah. What a great question. I will say this. It's probably the best PowerPoint presentation I've ever seen. <laughs> it's <laughs> a low bar. I mean, we've all seen a lot of them, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I bet in the audiobook, I love audiobooks for what it's worth. Love them. Um, I bet there's like an accompanying like PDF that you can look at. I've had audiobooks where it's like the narrator's like, see, page 57 in the P. And I'm like on my phone. <laughs> right, right. So I bet that's how they <laughs> handled it. A purpose. But you, I don't think there's any way you could read that mm -hmm. crazy PowerPoint yeah, chapter. I can't yeah. imagine. All right, Maurice, what was your other question? No, that was it. I was, oh, that was I, it. I, I was wondering about the whole uh, the, uh, the audiobook experience um, with the Goon Squad. I, I was just curious if uh, I was just trying to speculate what, what, what that would be like and how, how that would even work. Yeah, well, well. So I want to weigh in with um, the story of Miles and Drew and Sasha. I, I, I found that story to be really kind of moving. Actually, um, that was maybe my favorite story. The the stories you guys have all named are are the the story with Lincoln and the story with Alfred are both really funny. I mean, there's a lot of really funny stuff in this book. Um, but I, th I thought the story with Miles, who, you know, who Miles, uh, I think, brought up, you know, was the first in this book, or maybe, I, I don't quite remember it from the story with Bix, but he was the first one to bring up the idea of authenticity, really, the thing itself, he, which he first talked about in relation to going to get drugs from his drug dealer. I mean, it was a very simple transactional thing. It was just the thing itself, you know, and he tried to even start a relationship with his drug dealer, <laughs> right? But he found that, you know, pretty much the, yeah, that's hard to do with your drug dealer. <laughs> um, but, I, you know, I, I think it was interesting then that he... Um, he saw, he kind of realized that Sasha was an addict in the same way that he was an addict. And he wanted to see, you know, how, how she got out, how she turned in or what had happened to her. How mm -hmm. had she become this crazily successful artist? Um, and it just, it, it 
about broke him. I mean, when he when he yeah. actually saw her success, at first he, you know, he ridiculed it. But when he actually saw it from the air, I mean, it was too much. Mm-hmm. Um, I just thought that was a very moving story with a very moving, if kind of maybe unbelievable kind of ending <laughs> that he, you know, eventually then became a state senator. senator yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I also, I liked that chapter. I thought Miles was interesting. And I think when we first met Miles at the end of A Visit from the Goon Squad, it was just an aside about Ted talking about how he was pretending to care about his son's careers in sports when really he just cared about art. Uh, And I got kind of the least substance from Miles. uh, So I was really surprised to see him have like such a nice arc. Uh, and to see him cross again with like Sasha and with Drew, because I feel mm-hmm. like Drew and Miles were kind of alike in like their early stages of their lives or their teen years. Um, but I thought that was a great chapter, too. And I thought visually that the desert where their house is sounds beautiful. I would I don't know where I think it was probably like what, Arizona or something. I would love to go there. It sounds beautiful. Yeah, there was a um, as you you mentioned that. Christine, there was a there was just a beautiful um, a beautiful phrase that I remember from that, and I'm trying to find it here because um, one of the things that I, I think her language uh, is sometimes really beautiful, um, and I can't I can't find what what's oh no I, it wasn't that story it was the one with Alfred, and um, she says she writes. The moon was already up, soft and translucent as a sea turtle egg. And I thought that was just such a beautiful (laughs) image. And the moon appeared again in that story and a couple more times in the book. But just kind of like that changing appearance of the moon throughout, too. Yeah. You know, that kind of, you know, brings everything back to the idea of authenticity, you know, which was, um, you know, one of the things that Lincoln uh, struggled with was that the idea that you couldn't, uh, you couldn't like figure out, he couldn't figure out comedy, right? He couldn't figure out what was funny. But then in the chapter with Chris, he was actually figuring out all the beats of all the television shows. (laughs) Yeah. He had equations for like, uh, equations for comedy basically. And even for like romance and tragedy. I loved that chapter also. And especially I loved that chapter right after it was like Molly's chapter, like young Molly. Mm -hmm, Right. Um, And her, I think uh, Chris called them like stock blocks. Like he was his his whole Right, story blocks. Yeah, story blocks. Right. And so I like there was his chapter where he was like taking this like mathematical scientific approach to breaking down just like normal circumstances. And then the next chapter was Molly's and her whole chapter was just like a story block of like middle school girls and like a suburban drama. And it well, there were almost there was almost no punctuation in Molly's like it was a 12 year old's diary. I loved it. I loved those two chapters next to each other, too. I thought it was great. Yeah, the story blocks were all those tropes like hero (laughs) delivers comeuppance to perennial jerk. (laughs) Protagonist hits bottom alone at night on city streets with soulful music. (laughs) Blurred faces lean over protagonist, gradually sharpening. You know, it's like every one of those things you've seen a million times. Of course, yeah. Yeah. Now that we're talking about it, I'm realizing how cheeky that is. I mean, she's basically telling us what she's doing in, in formulas. And then living it out. And the chapter ends with that little defense of fiction. I mean, the book ends with that defense of fiction where Mm -hmm. she kind of explains it. Hmm. Yeah. Wasn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I want to come back and talk about the ending, too. But I also want to bring up the story that was narrated by Hannah, um, whose mom is Noreen, and they live next to... um, the Salazars <laughs> after Benny has moved out mm-hmm. and Jules has moved in. And Maurice, you don't know the backstory of Jules, but Jules was a magazine writer with a very sordid um, event in his past. And it kind of flipped him out and he got a, out of prison and then went to live with the Salazars. Um, but I want to I want to bring that up again at the end. But the idea in that chapter was the secret to a happy ending 
is knowing when to walk away. Mm-hmm. Mm. Um, and isn't that something Jules said? I think one of the characters actually says that, right? Well, Noreen says that. Oh, okay. In yeah, that, yeah. Right. In that story, <laughs> when she finally somehow, you know, makes peace with Jules. With Jules, yeah. Right. I loved Noreen. I She had a very small role in A Visit from the Goon Squad, and she was just told through the eyes of Stephanie, trying to fit in in Crandale in the suburb with Benny. Um, And I was, I kept hoping, like, I think the last we saw of Noreen in Goon Squad was like she was peering through a fence. And I was like, what is wrong with this woman? Mm -hmm. And then as soon as Hannah started describing her mother, or maybe it was Molly, one of them, one of the girls was describing their mother and I was like, this mother is crazy. And it was Noreen. Right. <laughs> I, yeah. And a lot of the ways that Noreen talked to her kids, she would say things like, oh, everything's hopeless, but please keep going to school or like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. I loved her. Um, I thought her, she was probably one of my favorites. Um, and yeah, just her insights I thought were the realest and I guess the most authentic in the book, maybe among the most authentic in the book. What didn't work? Any anything that you just went? Yeah, I'm not. I'm not into that. Well, unfortunately, it started with Bix, and I didn't care for Bix. I didn't. I was not interested in his little, you know, rich guy predicament. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was it's really nice when we moved right on. I'm so with you. I was like, <laughs> I was halfway through that, and I was like, oh man, I think when Ken calls me about this show, I'm going to be sick that day. <laughs> 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 Because it was tough to get through. It was yeah. tough to get yeah. through. Right. Yeah. I didn't like Vix. I don't, I just, I actually didn't care for, I think this was my biggest issue that I'm still trying to resolve is I just didn't care for Bix's company, Mandala. I didn't care for Chris's company, uh, Mondrian. I just, like, I don't, I feel like this book could have been successful without the like doom and gloom social media. I just like I'm trying to reconcile both of these like beautiful intersecting stories. And then like also um, the social media apocalypse. <laughs> and I'm just like, where, wh- why do I need both of these in this book? And almost we feels haven't, like I have a theory about that, but we haven't even talked about the fact that a big part of this is about saving your memory, mm-hmm. putting, you know, recording your entire memory and putting it in a box to be shared with the universe of people yeah. who have also shared their... Well, only if you want memories. to. You can just keep it for yourself. You don't have to take that next sure step. Can. But what ends up happening, there are some very sad explorations of old times in this book, including one where uh, a woman goes back to what she thought was the greatest trip of her life oh, with her father yeah. to discover that he really didn't want any part of that. Um, and he didn't even want her there. He didn't even yeah. want her there. That was Lou yeah. and, is that Roxy, I think? That was Roxy yeah, and Lou. Was Roxy yeah, and Lou. Mm-hmm. That was sad. Yeah. But I think that, first of all, this idea that any of that is concrete and you can just keep it and share it is ridiculous. But I think given the way the story is being told and this idea that we are looking around from all of these different perspectives, it is, it fits. It's the same thing that the characters are doing. She's doing in the storytelling. Yeah. Um, what do you think, Maurice? You're a science fiction writer. First of all, is this a science fiction novel? <clears throat> See, I almost I hate those kind of discussions. <laughs> uh, you, know, you know, is it fantasy? Is it sci-fi? Is it you know all this kind of? Well, discussion. I don't mean that well, even no, necessarily. Right, is right. it fan? I mean, right. what I mean. But, and what no, I'm asking is, clearly yeah. there are science fictional elements. There are some, there's Would some, you hang it on the science fiction rack? I don't know. And, and here's what, because in my mind, it's like there's always this divide. You know, because you have this on one side, you have what's the author's intent. You know, because I know when I'm setting down to write a sci-fi novel, or I'm setting down to write a horror novel. You know, I, there, there's my intent versus, all right, here's how it's going to be marketed. Um, and so, so I came to this book cold. So I, did, other than you telling me that there were these science science fiction elements to it, and then I get to that big chapter, I'm like, they better hurry up and come on. <laughs> I'm going to be out otherwise. <laughs> um, and so, 
I would say yes. It is. A, it's it's absolutely a science fiction novel. I would say yes. it's a soft science fiction. But I mean, because the sci- I mean, yes, there's those elements about memory and uploading all kinds of stuff. There's this, but then there's all that the sociological stuff that's being explored mm-hmm. too, which is just as valid as science fiction as anything else. Sure. Yeah, it's a social commentary, which I think the best science fiction kind of is a social commentary on both the past, present, and future. I guess all three. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All I know is this. I got a friend who is an avowed science fiction reader and turns up his nose at any literary fiction to read it. And he loved it. Wow. Mm. So that might be the <laughs> uh, purest way to slice that. That's the final answer. Although, yeah. although hey, the literary crowds are finally starting to uh, accept us and, 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 and join us, uh, wrap, wrap their arms around us and bring us into the fold now. So, Well, I mean, that, and we talked about that, Maurice, a couple weeks ago. And I just I see that more and more. So many of the best reviewed books of the year are science fiction novels. And I don't think they're sitting in the science fiction section of the bookstore. Right. Mm. Well, let's talk about those elements, you know, own your unconscious. And uh, they had the one where you could kind of wipe out memories, memory shop. Yeah. Like Um, gray grabs. Right. Gray grabs were like what you like. You couldn't actually. So as I understood the technology, you could record your own unconscious and play it back for yourself. And you could upload it to the Internet or whatever we're going to call it. And. But but people would not know that was you when you uploaded yeah, it. Yeah, it's supposed to be anonymous uploads. Right. Yeah. Right. So the gray grabs were anonymous. Yeah. Um, but so would we? I mean, if that if that came to pass, could we resist it? No. Oh wait, that was too quick. I'll wait. <laughs> I'll wait. <laughs> I think I could resist it. I am I'm haunted by my memories and the last thing I want to do is have them uploaded <laughs> to the cloud. I just I like I think especially and I feel like you were getting at this Tracy where it's like how do you capture memories cuz the way I remember something is probably not the way it happened. So am I capturing my memory of the event or the event and like I don't know. I I don't want that. I don't need I'm already haunted by my embarrassing memories, and I just don't need a litany of those. All I want all the time is to escape from my mind. Exactly. I want the opposite of... Right. I want to be unconscious. (laughs) Like, own your unconscious. No, I just want out of it. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know. There's nothing I... There's nothing I need to revisit. Yeah. And I was like literally daydreaming half the time of like, man, this would be so great if I just <laughs> live in my memories and live in my imagination more than I do now. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just, just the whole idea of just revisiting, uh, revisiting, uh, you know, a lot of the good memories, you know, because uh, you know, my life is made up of good memories as well as bad. And, uh, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I'd love to go back and revisit some of those good times. And, and, and you know, as a, you know, and, and always in this daydream, though, I'm always elderly. Uh, and 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 wanting to you know revisit my past. But what if they're not what we remember? That's I feel like that's my thing. The but way I mean, I remember but I think that's the question, though, Christine. What is it that actually gets yeah. uploaded? Because as we know, memories become less and less reliable yeah, over yeah. time. Oh, so no, I've spent a lifetime crafting myself as the hero <laughs> in my own story. But I'm pretty confident it's going to be uploaded. <laughs> Where do you come down on this, Ken? Yeah. Um. I want to say that I would be an eluder. Yeah. I'm not. I mean, I'm I I was certainly enamored of uh, social media for a while and I'm much less enamored of that right now. And I would hope that I would say, yeah, I really don't. I, I'm kind of with Christine and Tracy. I'm not sure I want to replay all my memories and I'm pretty sure I can resist uploading to collective conscience mm-hmm. consciousness yeah even if that means i can see other people's me- like the like i don't want to see my own memories much less other people's memories yeah. of me which are, i think in i would that would just kill me i couldn't do it no well, you know that there's people who say they want mind reading to be their superpower and i think that sounds mm-hmm. tragic i don't yeah. want to know what's in anyone's mind at any either. given time i can't even handle my own mind right <laughs> yeah i don't <laughs> want anyone else's thoughts i also i feel like i feel like you were getting at this too like would anyone actually upload all of their memories and consciousness freely for no reason because I feel like in this age of like data protection and privacy you give people the chance to opt out of cookies or to ask 
iPhone not to track your activity across apps. And as soon as people can opt out, I feel like most are like, yeah, let me out of this. What what's the incentive? Like would people I feel like the only way that people are willingly giving over that much information is if they don't know it. So like I feel like it would almost have to be disguised like the ancestry stuff. Right. Like it's like we'll tell you about your family and your ancestry. But really what we want is all of your DNA. <laughs> so I feel right. like it would almost have to be like. I don't know. Like, yeah. you get a, I don't know. Nope. I think a lot of people would do it. You think I so? Think a lot of people would gladly, I, I can, I mean, just looking at casually looking at social media now. Yeah. People are yeah, you're giving right. away so much information. Yeah. Everything. And, and, and they, they are knowingly, you know, yeah. you can tell them all you want. Oh, they're just data mining you. Oh, that's true. But here's what <laughs> I was on my vacation. Right. You know, and, and, <laughs> right. that. And, I, and I think a lot with that, especially with that whole idea of that collective unconscious thing, right? Mm-hmm. And like, what is at the heart of that? I, and as I, I kept thinking about that more and more, and I'm like, there is still, you know, when I keep talking, come back to that whole idea of there's this desperate longing that seems to be underpinning all of this. Yeah. In that, I'm wondering if that desperate longing is the illusion of community. Well, that's really interesting because um, in, in one of the stories she brings up, one of the characters brings up um, the Carson McCullers play. It was also, I think it might have been a novel also, uh, The Member of the Wedding. And that's really kind of what that whole story is about is the, the young girl, Frankie, uh, wants to become more than anything part of a we and I and I, I noted that in that too that maybe that's it and I mean the other thing I thought about is maybe it also has something to do with just a some kind of a quest for immortality if all my memories exist somewhere even if I die I'm kind of still alive mm-hmm. um, I think it's that for some like Lou I got the sense that it was that for Lou I also think a lot of these characters would be looking for closure um, like especially in the case of like I think Bix made his whole family revisit the moment where he thought of mm-hmm. collective consciousness or of Mandala. Um, so I feel like a lot of a lot of it was people are wanting closure for circumstances or relationships that they felt were unfinished or like otherwise ambiguous, which I feel like that kind of goes with community. But I think there is a huge community aspect to it as well. Agreed. You know, there was also it's interesting. um, you know, Facebook and Twitter and any social medium will also try to justify their existence by showing you all the good things about it. And there's the, in one of the last chapters of the mm-hmm. book, there's a long list of the good things mm-hmm. that came from all of this technology, including the elimination of child pornography, lots of crime solved. Um, a global rise in empathy that accompanied a drastic decline in purist orthodoxies. <laughs> right? I'm ready for that. Yeah, there's. I'm ready for it too. There's no way social media, or I don't think there's any way that would come from own your unconscious or anything like it. But, I would like to see that. That could be a whole book right there. Right, but, I but it that did. Was fascinating. So, <laughs> was it was it worth it? I mean, is the is it worth the cost of you know? I guess giving everything you have to everyone. The book doesn't really focus on the cost. No. Um, and I lack the imagination. Yeah, I don't know what the cost well, is. I mean, what I is think, the cost? I think the cost is a feeling of inauth- inauthenticity. I think that's what people are, like the people that were using proxies to elude um like being counted, I feel like they felt that their lives weren't authentic and private. And that to them was the cost. Mm. And I, I mean, I've, I kind of feel the same way. I've mostly stopped using social media and uploading every facet of every day of my life. And even I don't really take pictures on vacation and post them on social media anymore. What I've realized is I was spending a lot of time thinking about what will my Instagram post be about this or when will, when should I post to my stories or what should I add to my stories? I was spending time creating content instead of living it. And I feel like not having to worry about, like, if something happens, not having to put it on social media is so liberating. <laughs> like, probably no one cares. And then the people in my life that do care, I talk to them so I can tell them. But I feel like that's the cost is like, I think it just sort of takes you, I think, especially for the people that are using proxies to evade counting and like data mining, I feel like they were feeling that they were losing some originality and privacy and authenticity to their lives. But I don't think the book ever says that explicitly, so I could be wrong. 
No, I find the people who are inauthentic on social media in real life are pretty inauthentic anyway. <laughs> so, so, I, so the whole cost balance. I mean, it's like I, I look at it as just another tool. It's like, hey, this is there's here's a here's this tool. Here's this opportunity. How you choose to use it still yeah, on you. That's a good point, Maurice. I want to talk about word shells. Mm. Um, that was a concept actually from Goon Squad that was a little bit more developed here. Mm-hmm. Um, Tracy, what's your favorite word shell? <laughs> <laughs> was it word shell? I'm remembering word casing. Oh, I'm sorry. Word, word casing. Word casings. Yes, so yeah, that's a, correct. So it's a word that has kind of lost its meaning, right? Outside of quotation marks. Mm-hmm. Like if you use it, mm-hmm. you have to put it in quotation marks. Yeah, what were some of them? I'm not remembering um, any right now. Oh, well, I, I'll start with one. Perhaps authenticity. Yeah, that Is was really authenticity a yes. word casing? Does yes. that in this day and age have any meaning anymore? Yeah, I think, oh, here's, yeah, I highlighted that. So it was Rebecca's, uh, at the end of the Goon Squad, it was like Rebecca's um, dissertation, I guess, or something like that, where she was talking about word casings, um, words that don't have meaning outside of quotation marks. And she said, English is full of these empty words like friend and real and story and change. Oh, friend. <laughs> right. And she right. said, some Well, like, I mean, who's your friend on Facebook, right? Yeah, yeah, friends, like Facebook friends. Like, mm. I don't know these people or I don't, haven't talked to them since mm-hmm. high school. Um, and I think in the candy house, there was also that crazy professor of uh, Gregory's that mm-hmm. like, uh, I think her name was Athena. Athena, she right. was also like challenging her students to try to come up with an original word. Right. Um, and it was interesting, the alternatives. I highlighted too much. I, I think I uh, she also mentioned a sympathy casing. And I went to a couple of funerals this past week. And, you know, sympathy casings are, right, what do you say to someone who has just lost someone? If they become sympathy casings. I, one of my favorite word casings is um, quality. You know, it's, the, it's what drove Robert Pearson crazy in sending the art of motorcycle maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I keep thinking of this whole, whole idea of that we're in this constant battle or this constant act of reclaiming these words. Um, so, because uh, like a lot of them, the ones that kept coming to mind, uh, frankly, love. Yeah. Because love tends to, it, it loses all meaning because in some, it can, it can lose all meaning because of its ubiquity and how we use it. For example, and I think the word conversation, uh, which popped up a lot, you know, sometimes it's a, in, in media, sometimes it's marketing, sometimes in my church circles. It's like, oh, no, we have to be in conversation to the yeah. point where conversation meant nothing after a while. And same with community, mm. frankly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, that, that, that's a word. And, you know, I, I always framed them under the term, you know, popular buzzwords right now, which is the same sort of thing. It's like they are popular and, and uh, until they just so popular, they start to lose any sort of coherence after a while. Yeah. Storytelling. That's one that um, just kind of drove me crazy for a, a long while. <laughs> I think literally is a good one. Oh, I, oh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> when literally, literally literally means figuratively, <laughs> yeah. then it yeah. literally means we nothing. We know we've <laughs> lost it. Yeah. It also reminded me very much of, I think a lot of elements of this novel reminded me of 1984, but especially those word casings felt a lot like me, the concept, uh, felt to me a lot like the concept of Newspeak in 1984, where it's like, instead of language evolving, it's now devolving. Thing. We're losing words each year instead of gaining them. I feel like the word casings really make you think, like, how many words have we lost? <laughs> I think we've lost a lot. And I think I also don't necessarily know that that's a bad thing because I think it opens up new avenues to describe and think about things. Like once we've used a word to death, we literally have to move on. <laughs> we literally have to move on. And I think it is, I don't know, I think it's kind of fasc- fascinating in a way. Yeah, um, I agree. So um, so for those of you who have read both books, is the Candy House a better book than Goon Squad, or is Goon Squad a better book? Do you does it matter? Do you do they just kind of run together? Do you have to read them in order, or can you read them out of order since they both skip around all over the place? Yeah, I think they stand alone for sure. You two have read them more recently. I, I read Goon Squad. How long ago did that come out? Forever uh, ago. 2010. Oh, geez, what? Oh. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah, it's oh. been a while for me. I did not know that. Yeah, I, you know, I think ultimately I thought the Candy House was a stronger 
book. Um, Goon Squad was awfully, awfully good, and it's and just its description so vividly of the music industry and all those players in the music industry. It's really, it's really interesting book. But I think probably the Candy House had more to say. Mm. I feel like the Candy House almost had too much to say. <laughs> I think I liked the Goon Squad a little bit more. I yeah. thought it was more focused. Uh, and I think music is like the perfect background or like vehicle or driver for exploring feelings of like nostalgia or immortality or aging or memory or identity or self. I liked it. I liked like it's the Goon Squad started to lose me towards the end when I think Lulu and Alex were talking about like getting and like engaging parrots to promote Scotty's um new uh like concert they were like scotty's right. coming back and they were using parrots which in my mind were like influencers and they were calling children pointers and i was like for some reason i don't i don't know i don't need this so i think i liked the goon squad a little bit more i definitely love oh them gosh. both but i'm gonna have to read it again <laughs> i remember it as yeah. one of my favorite reads ever yeah so it'll be no hardship to go back to it <laughs> no i i think I think they are richer together, just again, because you have so much more backstory on some of those characters. Like Sasha, obviously, has a significant presence in the Candy House, but yeah. she had a significant presence in three or four yeah. different of the stories right. in Goon Squad. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, we're kind of getting close to where we have to wrap wrap up, but let's talk about the ending. Anybody have any thoughts about that last chapter, about Ames, the kind of... A uh, mysterious <laughs> middle child who always was forgotten. Do you know what I'm, so I'm looking? I feel so bad. I loved the ending because Ames was forgotten and mysterious. And do you know what I wrote? I wrote, oh, my gosh, I loved Miles. I meant Ames. <laughs> oh, I feel so <laughs> sad. Poor Ames. Wow. I can't believe I wrote that. Uh, I did like it, though. I thought Ames revisiting. I thought he was probably the most interesting, mysterious character. I wanted to know more about Ames. He was always an afterthought, so much so that I forgot the guy's name. Um, but I thought it was a really in interesting ending where it's like he's replaying the one moment in his life where he felt like the protagonist or felt like the star. It's when he hit like the home run in his little league game or whatever. Right. And the one thing they have to salvage from that day was they tried to find the baseball and his mom was too tired or lazy to find the right one. So she just picked one baseball and said, this is it. And I was like, that's right. So we're, we're questioning authenticity right <laughs> yeah, to the very end. That's terrible. Um, is it though? I mean, he has a baseball. It's, it's, it's yeah. symbolic think, of the thing. Right. I think Who it's cares? very Un symbolic. Unless he's tapping into the memory and then he sees that. Oh, his mom kicked the, right the other one under the bush. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I loved the ending, though. Yeah. I really, really liked it. But I felt a little betrayed because of that part where she's saying, well, I'm making this all up and th these things only exist in fiction mm. and that's how it works. It's like, oh, come on. You don't have to pop the balloon right here at the end. Yeah. Yeah, although I did love the, I mean, she she kept questioning through the chapter mm -hmm. right. wh whether this was the place to leave the story. Yeah. But going back to Noreen's advice, the secret to a happy ending is knowing when to walk mm -hmm. away. Mm -hmm. So was it a happy ending? Probably. <laughs> I don't know. It was an ending. <laughs> it was an ending. Yeah, everybody's still out there looking for... Resolution and community. Right. There was one line that I highlighted in the last. I also thought Gregory's chapter as the penultimate chapter was really good, mm -hmm. um, especially because he was the opening chapter. Um, and luckily, I wrote down who he was, or else I would have been like, I don't know Gregory. So I'm glad I wrote down <laughs> right. that he was. He was, like, oh, he was still son? breastfeeding Bixen when he was three son, years old. He was like five, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, but she writes. Um, but knowing everything is too much like knowing nothing without a story. It's yes. all just information. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Which I thought was just like. I highlighted that too. Yeah. Yep, <laughs> I did too. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, quickly, recommend it. Oh, yeah. 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 Absolutely. Yeah. We're, well, I think we're all in agreement yeah. about that for pretty strong recommendations. Well, with that, let's talk about recommendations. Mm. Christine, yes, you have a recommendation? I do. I had a recommendation in mind initially, but I have a different one in mind now. I think if you enjoyed this book and you liked the interweaving of all these different stories, I recommend a book called Girl, Woman, Other. I read it a couple years ago. It's by Bernardine Evaristo. And it's about how the identities of all these different 
lives of black women in uh, the UK sort of intermingle and intertwine and come to fruition. Um, I think it also takes, I mean, I know that it also takes really crazy stylistic choices like the Candy House and uh, A Visit from the Goon Squad. There's almost no punctuation in Girl, Woman, Other. It's really weird. I know. It feels impossible. It reads like poetry. Or for the first chapter, I was like, I don't know what I'm reading. And then you, it just makes sense. Mm. And when periods are used, they're very impactful. Mm. Um, highly recommend that book. It's, I think, I, I mean, I liked it more than The Candy House, honestly. But it's the same thing with, like, all these different characters and storylines where the character that's in the forefront rotates to the background and someone else comes to the mm. front. And at the end, it all comes together. Yeah, that sounds fascinating. Yeah, really good book. Yeah. Tracy, what do you got? I'm going with a classic. I think this is one that Noreen... Is you know everything is terrible, but go to school would enjoy, and it's one when things are dark like they are now in the world. I always turn to it's Waiting for Godot by Samuel Ooh. Beckett, which is absolutely one of my favorite pieces of literature, and it it is very much okay. Well, everything is ridiculous and awful, but hey, here's a here's a hilarious truth. <laughs> it makes me feel better. Yeah. Gosh, I haven't read that for the longest so, time. I read it thanks last for, summer. It's yeah, absurd thanks for in the best way. Popping it into my head again. Yeah. Maurice. So I'm going to go with complete self-interest, and I'm going to recommend Sweep of Stars by this young up-and-coming writer named Maurice Broadus. Oh. Um, uh, uh, Sweep of Stars. I'm doing this at Ken's urging, mind you, just so you know. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, with Sweep of Stars, it's about a, a Pan-African-led uh, uh, intergalactic community. Whoa. And uh, speaking of stylistic choices, the author in question, um, <laughs> uh, there are at least six POV characters, some chapters told in first person, some in second, some in third, some in first person plural, um, all revolving around this idea of what does community mean hmm. and what is their relationship to community as they are taking steps out into the universe to uh, explore many of the mysteries out there. Oh, that sounds awesome. Do you know, happen to know where we can purchase this book, Maurice? You can purchase this book. <laughs> I was just, just so moved. <laughs> um, you may purchase this book anywhere. Excellent. All your bookstores. Excellent. Thank you. What's your recommendation, Ken? My recommendation is I read another novel this summer, a new novel called The Immortal King Rao mm -hmm. uh, by Wahini Wara that has a lot of the same conceit as The Candy House. Like people can like upload and store their memories and it's... Um, like it's a society that's ruled by an algorithm. And if you buy into it, you know, whatever the algorithm says goes. And there are people who don't want to and they get shoved off onto islands. And it's really um, it is, I would say it is a more conventional treatment of a very similar kind of technology. That's a it's a, a really good story. Um, and it's also, you know, not unlike the Candy House, kind of a generational saga as well. Yeah, it's really good. Uh, the Immortal King Rao. Um, well, that's going to do it for us uh, for this edition of Radio Free Book Club. We've been talking about The Candy House by Jennifer Egan uh, for Tracy Cumbe, Christine Hudson, Maurice Broadus, all the members of Radio Free Book Club. I'm Ken Honeywell. Join us again next month when we'll be discussing Julia Mae Jonas's sharp new campus novel, Vladimir. Until then, read a book. <laughs>